Thank you very much, Terry. Um, good evening. Hello. Hi. For those uh, who don't know me, I'm Vladimir Šimek. I'm the solutions architect at uh, Amazon Web Services uh, now for more than three years. I'm covering Central Eastern Europe. Um, so I'm helping customers with their journey uh, to the cloud, mostly from technical point of view, uh, helping them, you know, choose the right solution for their use cases, uh, and doing public speaking as I'm doing right now on the on today's meetup. Uh, as uh, Teresa mentioned, our today's team is uh, Kubernetes as a managed service. If you have been watching uh, the presentation or the conference that we had last November and December. Uh, in Las Vegas reInvent, we announce the service EKS, Amazon Elastic Container Service for Kubernetes. What that means, I will speak in the next approximately 60 minutes, uh, including with some demo, hopefully it will work. Uh, we will see if the gods will be merciful to us and to me as well. So before we go further, how many of you know what Kubernetes is? Please raise your hand. So majority, and how many of you are using Kubernetes now? Well, about half of people, awesome. So uh, if you've been in the previous uh, meetup when I was uh, presenting the, uh, the topic on the containers, uh, one of the things that I told you, and for those who are actually running this uh, already in production, so you know that running one container on your laptop or anywhere else is pretty easy. Right? You just set it up, play, do, no problem. But if you have hundreds or thousands of containers, it's not that easy anymore. You need some tool that will help you with placement, with, with scheduling, and basically the whole life cycle, making sure that if one of the containers goes down, that there is some reboot or restart mechanism, and so on and so on. For that, we use orchestration tools, and one of them these days very popular, actually in the last 12 months probably, uh, is called Kubernetes. So for those who don't know what Kubernetes is, what it is, it's a container management platform. Uh, it helps you to run and orchestrate containers at a scale and gives you primitives for building modern applications in the age of cloud. But the question is, why developers love Kubernetes? Because actually this is not a product that someone will sell you. It will not come that, yeah, buy Kubernetes from us. And if you are not a developer yourself, probably you heard about Kubernetes from some developer guys that are using it because it makes their life easier. But there are three reasons, three main reasons from my point of view, uh, that make Kubernetes very popular with the developers which they are. The first one, it's uh, surrounded by a vibrant and growing community of users. So actually, I took a look uh, two days ago into the GitHub repo. This is the open source, so you can find it on GitHub, and found that uh, it has almost 400,000 comments, 35,000 stars, 63,000 commits and 1,600 contributors. So it's pretty lively project. Uh, I heard some statistics that it's somewhere between one to five on the top five list uh, of the open source projects, probably somewhere very close to Linux. So first is the community. Second, very popular reason, Kubernetes can be run anywhere. Whether it's your laptop, where you run your Minikube, or whether it's your on-premises data center environment where you run your own Kubernetes clusters, or you can run it in the cloud. The one of the advantages, regardless where you're running it, you get single extensible API. So the same commands you use to run on Minikube work with, uh, with your data center, work in the cloud, so that makes any kind of deployment or migration, if you need, very easy to do. And this extensible API has large scale. It's pretty much performant in most of the cases. And it has a breadth because it's extensible. So you can put any kind of pluggable uh, modules into that. And I will speak about one of them uh, today. And yeah, helps you and makes your life easier. 
uh, Kubernetes and containers in general, they, as I mentioned, help you to create uh, cloud native applications that scale well on the horizontal, that uh, can sustain some kind of disruption so they can reboot and are basically in line with the recommendations how to build microservices. So how to you know, divide monolith into smaller chunks that communicate to one each other through some API interfaces. So what is important to keep in mind, you have this Kubernetes, you have this management orchestration platform that can be run anywhere, but if you have the best application in the world, if it runs in a not ideal environment, uh, it might be for users bad experience. So if you run it, probably you will not run production cluster on your laptop at home or at work, whatever. If you have the platform, underlying platform, the infrastructure that cannot scale well, that it cannot uh, basically respond well to the amounts of, uh, of requests that you will get probably for, from your users. If uh, you have high latencies, so the experience of your users will be pretty bad. So it's not only our opinion, it's opinion of the CNCF uh, survey uh, people that actually responded to the survey. Uh, that uh, was conducted by Cloud Native uh, Compute Foundation that covers the development of uh, Kubernetes, that 63% of Kubernetes workloads, production workloads, uh, run on AWS. Currently, how you can run on AWS the Kubernetes, I will show you. So this is the general architectural best practices that we recommend for our customers when they run their Kubernetes, uh, their Kubernetes clusters. First, you need to have three masters in high availability deployment. So that means to put those masters into separate availability zone. So who doesn't know what availability zone is? Please raise your hand, I will explain. So you know what AZ is? Great. Uh, so I will go a little bit further. So if we check the master, why it's so important, these are the functionalities that it provides. It's the API single point, uh, which you use for managing your containers, your pods. Uh, it controls uh, all what's happening in the cluster. Uh, it has also the schedulers, so scheduler. So it decides where it will put your containers, to what instance. Uh, the next functionality, it also has the add-ons. And these extensible add-ons help with functionality like DNS, or if you, if you are using the graphical user interface, so things like dashboard, and so on. Besides running a master in separate availability zones, you have to run the etcd. Etcd is a key value store that is part of the Kubernetes where the master stores its state. If your etcd goes down, you will have a pretty bad night. I will guarantee you that. So that's the reason you need to have it in the high available deployment. And before you are actually installing Kubernetes cluster, you need to make decision whether this etcd will run on their separate servers or whether you install it on the same server as the master. Uh, the decision factor might be what happens if you will be doing the upgrade of the Kubernetes. What might happen to the etcd? So as I said, if you lose it, pretty bad things happen in general. And at the end, you have the actual worker nodes where you run your containers. Uh, usually it's in the auto-scaling group. So that means you know, it can add or remove instances as you are on the go as you need. So if you are, imagine that you are the one who just wants to start uh, with Kubernetes cluster on Amazon Web Services. So let's assume you are either enterprise or small business or even individual guy who is building the next disruptive thing in his garage, is using AWS, heard that, yeah, Kubernetes is great, I want to have this as a managing on my Docker containers. So how can I deploy it? So what tools are available? to build a Kubernetes cluster on AWS. There's actually a list of projects on GitHub, and there are 16 options as of now. 
So, okay, probably you don't have time to try all those 16, so let's Google like which one of those is probably most popular or can be used and so on. So it's called COPS. So it's excellent community tool, so let's use it to build a cluster on AWS. This is what you need to do. First, you have to install some binary files. So COPS tool, AWS command line interface tool, kubectl, uh, which is the CLI tool to communicate with the uh, Kubernetes cluster. You have to create some user. You have to give him some permissions to access virtual machines, EC2 instances, DNS server, object storage, uh, VPC, the networking, and so on. Then you need to configure the client itself, and so on, and so on. So it's a lot of steps, and you are not running single container yet. You are just running probably the single master. So you need to do it like three times in each availability zone, and yeah, it's lot of work. So many customers actually came to us uh, with a request like, okay, we are a little bit afraid to do that. Yeah, it's open source. Uh, it's described like, yeah, it works, but just the installation process is kind of cumbersome. What, what about the rest, right? What about the management? What about patching? What about monitoring? Uh, what about keeping high availability? So at the end, they are afraid that they will lose or end something like this. Right, just falling servers on their hand. So as Amazon Web Services already has experience of providing open source projects as a managed service, uh, example is a relational database service, RDS, Elasticsearch, uh, or uh, managed Hadoop, EMR. So they came to us with this request. Please run Kubernetes for me. Okay, what else? Besides running Kubernetes, we would like to have uh, integration with the AWS things like VPC networking, like load balancing, uh, like, I don't know, probably accessing S3 or any other tools. But we want to have the open source Kubernetes experience. So don't create any kind of forks, any your specific AWS versions. Give us the opportunity to use all the open source tools that we are already using with Kubernetes. So, as I mentioned last year on reInvent, we announced the Amazon EKS Elastic Container Service for Kubernetes that is supposed to remove all this burden of installation and managing the Kubernetes cluster or Kubernetes masters for you. By creating this service, we have four basic tenants. First of all, EKS is supposed to be a platform for enterprise to run the production workloads. What is the problem with many open source solutions? They are great, they have great functionality, but when you have to run them in production in enterprise, they lack these enterprise features, whether it's probably scalability, whether it's security, and so on. So this is one of the first prerequisite for many enterprises. Make sure that the product is enterprise ready and it's supported by someone. So when something goes wrong, there is some throat we can choke. Tenant number two. Um, EKS provides native and upstream Kubernetes experience. As I mentioned, our intention is not to have any kind of Amazon Kubernetes fork. It has to be completely based on uh, upstream open source Kubernetes. Number three, if EK customers want to use additional AWS services, they have the option to use it, but they will be not forced to do that. So that means all the improvements that will go into the upstream from us, from Amazon Web Services, will allow customer to run Kubernetes seamless, regardless whether they use it as a managed service, EKS, or they use it on their own managed uh, Kubernetes as an infrastructure, as a service running on the EC2 instances. And last but not least, EKS team actively contributes to the Kubernetes project. And I will speak about open source and our contribution at the end of the presentation a little bit more. So let's go back to the picture. 
So the, the higher side, this master and etcd, is the part that we, with the service EKS, remove from you. And your responsibility or worry or things you have to deal with will be just the lower part, your actual worker nodes. How it will look like? It's like this. Instead of three separate masters that you have to manage, instead of three separate etcds, you have just this URL or endpoint that you will point your command line kubectl and will work with. And with that, you will deploy your worker node, your instances that will run your pods or containers on Kubernetes. And of course, you will use the auto-scaling for that. Of course, when you are starting or deleting cluster or whatever kind of operation you do with EKS, you have to have API on uh, Amazon Web Services. So not just Kubernetes, but the cluster management kind of uh, API. As of now, this product is in preview. And we have four APIs available that you can use with. I will show you. First is the how to create a cluster. So from command line with AWS EKS create cluster, you provide a name, what master version do you want to use, and what role are you using, uh, or what kind of permissions it can use for, uh, for example, starting, uh, starting the instances, connecting to the VPC, to the network, and so on, and so on. And I actually forget, uh, forgot to add there, uh, you have to provide also the VPC ID. I will show you in a moment on the command line, uh, not command line interface, but on the GUI. So with if this is successful, you will get some you know, JSON response that will provide uh, you some information. What is important? will be this master endpoint. This is most important information. The other API is to describe the cluster, which is pretty simple. You just put the command and the uh, uh, cluster name. Again, some response. You can also list clusters if you have more than one, but this might be interesting for you. Again, some response. And if you don't need a cluster anymore, you just delete it with this command. So let's go to the demo first. I will tell you uh, what you are. Uh, what we are running for you are the masters and at CD, the worker nodes you have to run yourself. At the current stage, uh, you have to have the CloudFormation template that will do it for you. Uh, because there is no way at the current stage how to do it automatically. Welcome. So, I will open my command line. Hopefully you can see it. Let me clear. I was testing if the pings work. Can you see it even from behind or should I just make it a little bit bigger? Okay, great. Seems like you have good eyes, guys. Congratulations. So, I will cheat a little bit. <laughs> I will do a copy paste commands because sorry I don't keep them in my in my head. So what I will do first, I already have the uh, cluster created. So I will list what kind of clusters, uh, EKS clusters I'm running. So AWS EK list clusters and it shows me that I have one cluster with this name EKS demo. So I will then want to get information about okay, what kind of cluster is this? What is important for me is this master endpoint that I will use for configuration of my kubectl, which I already pre-configured, so I don't have to do it right now. So this is from the command line. Let's see how the GUI looks like. I need to open some browser. Let's go with Firefox. opening opening and you can see it's very rich GUI interface uh, I have one cluster running so if I click on that I got basically the same information I got from the command line yeah a little bit maybe sparse again I can see master endpoint I can see the kubernetes version that I'm running and this is uh, that it's active if I want to create a cluster so instead of all the steps as you saw with the COPS project or anything else, you just click on create cluster, 
put there some name, choose the version. Currently, during the preview, only this version is available. You have to put the VPC ID, so your ID of the VPC uh, of the network that you will run your worker instances, so the Kubernetes clusters know where to communicate with, and ARN. As Kubernetes is a service, it has to have some permissions. Uh, to run on AWS platform. So in ARN, Amazon resource name, these permissions are predefined for you and you just put there uh, which ARN this, this is. I'm not going to do that right now. So we'll go a little bit on the kubectl, on the command line interface for the Kubernetes. So I want to show, I want to see what kind of configuration I have for my kubectl. So the, again, most important thing for you is this endpoint that points me to my EKS cluster. Actually, a uh, little bit deeper from the architectural perspective, as you have three masters in EKS, there is a load balancer in front of them that helps you with this URL or endpoint uh, send the basically communication to the proper proper node, even if probably one of the masters might go down for whatever reason, right? So this guarantees you high availability. No, no, you don't. It's, it's provided automatically for you. The question was if uh, we have any control of the of the masters. I, I need to repeat the, the question just for the record. Now I recall. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, currently, the only information, uh, so the, the question was if I uh, get any information if uh, one of the masters or any of the masters goes down. Currently, the only information that you get there is that you saw on the GUI is whether the cluster is active or not. Uh, probably in the future version, we might get any kind of notification, but this should be transparent for you. So if the cluster is working, for you it should be like, you still cannot do anything, right? If one of the nodes goes down, it's managed for you. So this information, is it important for you? I don't know. Is it? <laughs> yeah, so if, if there will be requirement from the customers, we might build it. But as I'm thinking right now about it, probably doesn't make sense. Uh, come again? I didn't get that. Yeah, uh, when I set the VPC ID yes, for the worker nodes. No, 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 you can't. Uh, the the so the question was whether you can reach out the endpoint, uh, whether if the masters are running on the same VPC ID. No, they are not. They are running in the managed control plane of AWS, where you don't have direct access with. However, the connectivity or communication between your worker nodes and the Kubernetes master nodes uh, is uh, through the solution or product called private link. I will speak about it a little bit more later on, what it is. So. I checked some information about my uh, my cluster information, so I can see the Kubernetes master is running at this at this uh, endpoint, and there is the service called kubeDNS. So let's check the nodes. That means the worker nodes that are running and are connected to the Kubernetes. As you can see, I have three nodes running three days basically uh, when I created uh, the cluster when I was testing it first. Uh, and I can see they are running in the US West too. So for those who already have the access to uh, the preview, uh, the preview is running on Oregon region, so US West too. And I can see those instances because they are just EC2 instances on the EC2 console as well. So if I open my console, as you can see, I'm in Oregon and I will go to the EC2, where is it? Uh, EC2 dashboard. I can see the instances running here. Yeah, so they are currently distributed among two availability zones, so US West 2B and two instances in the 2A. 
Um, how they were created, as I mentioned, there is currently no automatic mechanism to start these worker nodes. So what I had to do, I run a cloud formation template that was provided with the documentation that we have. And you can see it, this is EK, no, let's keep it loading. This EKS demo working out. So uh, for those who don't know, CloudFormation is a template written in JSON or YAML that basically defines your resources running in Amazon Web Services. Actually, is the text version of your data center. Yes. Uh, currently, the masters are not created with a cloud formation. They are created with uh, this clicking. Yeah. Uh, however, what I needed to run, I, I've created separate VPC for the master. Sorry. Yeah. If there is a plan to, to support uh, the master nodes with a cloud formation, absolutely. Yes, because all the resources that are running on AWS should be uh, scriptable with cloud formation. It's it's not always available immediately always, uh, as the service goes uh, general available, GA, but as the time goes, we add the support. So I'm sure this will be part of the uh, cloud formation as well, because it makes sense. Ses? Simple email service. I don't need to check on that because, sorry, I don't know. But yeah, you might be uh, right. So, okay, so we checked the notes that I have there. Let me see if I have any services running. So you will not have the feeling that I'm, you know, just lying here when I will be deploying something that is running before that. It's actually not. The only service that's running is currently Kubernetes. And I can check if any pods are running there as well. No resources found. So there's nothing. What I'm going to do right now is to deploy a PHP guestbook uh, application from Kubernetes Tutorial. So if any one of you has been already going through the Kubernetes uh, documentation, you know that there is this tutorial of deploying this PHP guestbook uh, that actually stores the data on the Redis, so it's completely uh, stateless. And I will do right now something that I heard yesterday on the Kubernetes conferences that I never should do in the production. So guys, for your information, never do that. Uh, I'm actually applying the template directly from the internet, from the GitHub. So again, if you are running this in production or will be running this production, and it's not just EKS, any, any, uh, any container that you are specifying with YAML or JSON file, First, make sure you know what is content of this JSON file. So the first step, number one. I don't know the solution. Well, what, what solution is that? Notary. Mm -hmm. Well, might be solution for that if it can check the source and the, and the content and everything. Uh, just not sure if it will not add additional abstraction layer or complexity in the whole deployment. It, it really depends. So usually it's better to use the sources or the definitions of the pods from uh, no liberal resource of probably your own uh, GitHub repo or anything like that, that you know that hasn't been tempered and you know what is there. But notary, if that works that way, it might be the solution, but I don't know. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. Might be. I, I still uh, see that there are many companies that actually don't trust things like, for, for example, Docker Hub, right? So from compliance and security perspective, they cannot pull the repositories from Docker Hub. So they have their own solution, whatever it is, just making sure that it's in line with all the security and compliance requirements. So just keep that in mind. I think this is, this is good to know that, okay, I didn't think about it when I was creating the demo that, yeah, probably this is the problem. So, <laughs> uh, so first I create the Redis master replication controller until or unless someone changed the content of the file, which I'm not going to review right now, and will not then mine bitcoins or anything like that. All right. So then I need to create the Redis master service. Okay, create it. Good, we are successful. Then I need to create ready slaves. So first as a as a replication controller, great, create it. Then as a service. Awesome, create it. And now I need to create the front end that will actually uh, be the front end for my communication on the guestbook. So create it as a replication controller and now as a service. Okay, create it, great. So if I take a look at the pods, now you can see that I have six pods running in the default namespace. So I have three guestbooks uh, or three pods running the guestbook front end, two uh, Redis slaves and one Redis master. So now the application is running. So let's give it a try and try to connect to that if it really works. So I will run this command to get services and the information on the endpoint, on the URL that I'm supposed to connect. So I will try to copy paste. There might be some delay between the propagation of the DNS. Uh, so it might take a few seconds until it is available. So if we get some error message, we will not panic, or I will try not to, at least. And we'll try to retry in some time frame. And in the meantime, let's give it a few seconds. Uh, do you have any more questions? Yes. Uh, this. Uh, yes. 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 Uh, now let me think. I would need to check whether I created this with a with a template uh, or no. Actually, this wasn't created with a with a cloud formation template. This is the URL uh, provided with the uh, with the cube uh, DNS service, right? <laughs> Site still cannot be reached. Yeah. Excellent question. So how do I authenticate against the master with my cube cuddle CLI? Uh, here I have to admit I'm cheating a little bit. Uh, I'm not using the generally available cube cuddle that is currently, you know, on the on the GitHub or whatever you are downloading it. It's uh, for the purpose of the of the preview. It's uh, updated with the IAM credentials. So it can, and I will show the, the picture how it works actually. So it's a, it's a solution from Haptio, it's open source again, that allows you to do the authentication of the user of the Kubernetes cluster uh, against IIM, identity and access management that's running on AWS. However, what we are trying to have uh, is that this functionality or open source uh, solution will be part of uh, the upstream once EKS is already available uh, for general public. So as you can see, it works great. So I can try to put some data, AWS me to Prague, submit, yeah, and Hello world, and the thing that is important for the all data scientists, 42. So 
as you can see, there's basically not a difference in the Kubernetes that you are currently running on your own and the Kubernetes that is provided to you as a service. With the exception, this operational burden is completely off your shoulders. It's just this URL or endpoint. So the question is, what about the logs? And I will speak about it in a moment. Uh, so how it's architected, I already mentioned. It's control plane with three masters, three at CDs in three availability zones provided in the front of load balancer with some endpoint that you connect with your kubectl. So what is the master node configuration in the EKS? Uh, this is actually one of the interesting things because if you are deploying your Kubernetes in on your in on-premises environment or even in AWS or any other cloud provider uh, where it's not a managed service, you have to make few decisions. One of the decision is, for example, what kind of networking are you going to use? Whether it's Flannel, whether it's Calico, whether it's whatever, it's there available. Uh, what is the size of the masternode instances, actually? Because, of course, the larger the instance, the more workload it can manage. On the other side, you pay more for that. We have some general guidelines uh, for architectures. Like, for example, if you have one to five worker nodes, then probably some M3, the smallest one, I don't know if it's M3 large or whatever, uh, it's the best solution. If you have something like 500 nodes plus, then probably you should go with some uh, C5, 8x large, whatever instance is available there. Question? So the question was, uh, if there is no way, we cannot uh, provide any kind of scaling of the instance types. And the answer for the EKS service is yes. We'll do that for you automatically, so you don't have to do this decision anymore. So again, completely transparent, depending on the number of worker instances, we will uh, actually set up or change the size of the instance on the run for you. So due to the fact that it's running in three availabilities on three masters, uh, it should not be any visible for you. So you will not see. Just like when you are using things like uh, load balancer on AWS, network load balancer, you don't know what, how many resources we are providing for you to make sure that it can handle the load. And the same will happen here, right? So it will be completely transparent and off your shoulders. So auto-scaling of the master nodes is on our shoulders from now. Good. There was a question about the logs. Logs are very important. Uh, so because due to the fact that EKS is running on the control plane, you cannot log into those with your root account and check, you know, whatever, send the logs, the syslog, whatever solution you use. So the visibility you will get through two things. First is the metrics, and second is the logs. So first, uh, the built-in solution or integrated solution from Amazon Web Services is the CloudTrail that sends all the information about the API calls that have been happened uh, on the AWS platform. So every time you create the new cluster uh, on uh, uh, AWS EKS cluster, when you delete it, this information will be recorded and stored in the CloudTrail. It's usually good for security and compliance check because you know who did what on AWS, if he changed, for example, configuration of the security group, or changed the routing table on the VPC, or changed or created new VPC, whatever, right? The other thing is the CloudWatch. If you already know the uh, managed solutions from AWS, things like Redshift that has been mentioned today, you know that there are some metrics directly visible, like, I don't know, CPU, how much is used, how many bytes are processed, uh, how much RAM is used, and so on and so on. These metrics will be available for you through CloudWatch. However, we'll not stand a stop up there. If you are now using any kind of open source tooling for your monitoring and logs, not at the level of master instances of the Kubernetes cluster, but at the level of nodes, the worker nodes, 
of the level of containers or application yourself, you will be able to use those. As I said, the one of the talents that we have is to provide complete open source experience even with a managed service. So if you use any of those, and I saw yesterday in the conference that, uh, you know, InfluxDB, Graphite, uh, of course, Grafana, uh, Kibana, or the dashboard add-on, they are used a lot in the production environments. So you can use them as well. Yes. Yes. You will be able to do that through the CloudWatch. Because the all the logs will from masters will go to the CloudWatch and then you can send them further to any kind of solution that you want to use. Exactly. So uh, I was mentioning already something about the add-ons. So can I run Kubernetes add-ons on my EKS uh, EKS uh, masters? Answer is yes, but <laughs> the thing is, it's managed service. So again, you cannot just log in and install anything you want on that. However, we will support all the major add-ons that our customers are using. And if there are any that will be not supported after the GA, the general availability, let us know. Our service team will make sure we support those. So by default, I know that we will definitely support the Cube DNS that is already running there and the dashboard. And you should have the option to use many more add-ons that make this platform so good for you with this extensibility, uh, extensibility functionality. So we already have been speaking about the worker nodes that as of now, you have to have the CloudFormation template. So you cannot do direct call from the EKS uh, master node and yeah, spin up 10 EC2 instances for me so I can run my Docker pods, whatever, on those, uh, those instances. So right now, it's kind of half automated process. However, uh, when you are running those worker nodes, they have to be configured to communicate with, uh, with the EKS, uh, EKS masters. So currently we provide the AMI, Amazon Machine Image, so virtual machine template that is already pre-configured for you. It's based on Amazon Linux. However, again, open source experience. We might have customers that don't want to use Amazon Linux for whatever reason. They are pretty much used of the CoreOS, CentOS, Ubuntu, whatever they like to run. And all the configuration that we do, that we pack into that AMI, making sure it works well, we will provide on the GitHub through the packer. So you can do your own AMIs just based on the packages that you will find on the GitHub there. So you can have the same experience regardless of the version of the Linux that you want to run there on the worker nodes. What is the networking configuration for the EKS? This is interesting topic. Uh, you know, at least those that are using Kubernetes, that it has the option to use the CNI. Uh, CNI, the, the network plugins. Currently, there is an open source project provided by AWS that allows you to run Kubernetes with the VPC network address space. Up to now, if you run Kubernetes on AWS, you know you have to run, uh, you have to install some overlay networks, Calico, Flannel, whatever. From now on, with the EKS, there will be no need for that because the pods that you will be running on that uh, worker nodes will get the IPs from the ad address space that is part of your VPC. I will show you in a second. So this is the link that you can find the uh, Amazon VPC CNI uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, repo on the GitHub, currently in alpha stage. And this is how it works. So imagine you have two worker nodes, two uh, virtual machines, EC2 instances. Each of them has connected to the Elastic Network Interface, ENI. You have some pods running, some Nginx, some Rails on uh, both of the servers. And you want to, of course, if you start them, you want to have the way to address uh, or uh, to route the network traffic. So they need some AP IP address. What the CNI plugin does, 
it does the API call against the VPC plane with the EC2 associate address. Because if any of you is deep dive deeper in uh, AWS networking and EC2 instances, you know the Elastic Network insta uh, instances, Elastic Network interfaces, sorry, uh, can have secondary addresses assigned. So with this uh, EC2 associate address, it will get the IP, secondary IP address, and then we'll be able to distribute it to those spots. What you need to keep in mind is that the number of the ENIs uh, depends, that you can connect to your EC2 instance, uh, depends on the size of the instance. So we have instances that, for example, T2 Micro or T2 Nano, that can have two ENIs maximum. We have C5, 8x large, that can have 15 of those ENIs. Each of the ENI has also limited number or set number of the secondary IP addresses that it can have. So the T2 Micro has two secondary IP addresses per ENI. So that means that will, in total, allow you to run four pods. Probably on the T2 Micro, there is no reason to run more than that. If you will run those largest instances with 15 uh, elastic uh, network interfaces, they have limit of 50 secondary IP addresses per ENI. So 50 times 15 gives a pretty nice number. But still, keep this in mind. There is this restriction, so if you run more than 750, if I calculate it right, uh, pods on one instance, you might get out of the address space. But you still have the option, if you don't like this functionality, you can still run the overlay networks. Calico, Flannel, where you will not have this restriction. So, yeah, uh, the question was about the limit of the EC2 instances. So each and every account that you start on AWS or AWS account has certain limits on the number of instances that you can run. But regardless whether you are running, you know, Kubernetes or whatever containers on them, or just running, you know, some database on top of them, or just Linux server, Nginx, whatever, this limit applies all the time. Right? It's for your own protection, actually, because uh, we want to avoid a situation that some new customer opens account, doesn't have much experience, and with one API command, run thousands of servers uh, that will cost him, you know, palm times thousand times hour or second, depending what kind of instance he will run. Right? So yeah, if you go, if you need to go beyond the limit, you need to check with the support and ask for the limit increase. But it applies for all EC2 instances. So let's speak a little bit about the security. Again, those that have a lot of experience with Amazon Web Services know that if you have something like security groups, which is our virtual firewall, it applies on the ENI level, of the level of the network interface. So let me go a little bit back and show so imagine that you don't have two pods. You might have 100 pods, 500 pods. The security group will apply to all 500 pods, which is not very useful, because you might have requirement that different pods should have open different ports. And with security groups, you cannot achieve that. So how can you solve this? There is a project that we are working with, with uh, Tigera, that is the developer of the Calicom project, that will allow you to integrate the Kubernetes network policies on the pod level. So not just the ENI, not just the security group, but you can go up to the level, to more granular level, up to the pod. So you will set up the ports uh, that will be allowed to be open for that pod. Uh, it's open source, uh, at, but it has the commercial support from Tigera. And uh, we are striving to make sure this will be already part of the EKS during the time of the GA. So what will allow you to do that? First of all, 
you can do the stage separation. So you can have on the same uh, virtual server running uh, pods or containers. Some of them are for production, some of them are for uh, development, but still have different ports open. You can also do the tenant separation. Yesterday on the conference, I heard about the use case uh, that uh, the user or the, the customer that is running uh, Kubernetes cluster n has requirement to host uh, containers for several different customers. And these customers have different requirements. They have different policies. And of course, you don't want those pods from different customers to see each other and communicate with each other. So with this separation at the pod level, you can achieve that. And not to, to mention or not to forget is the compliance requirements, whether it's PS, uh, PCI for the financial companies or any other compliance that needs these controls on such a granular level uh, will be achieved with this solution. Uh, I already mentioned that because there was a question how the kubectl communicates with the with the Kubernetes master on the EKS. Yes, I am authentication. And we are using, again, open source approach that is providing by Heptio that allows you to set up IAM, identity and access uh, management authentication with Kubernetes. How it works, uh, here's the link if you are interested. Uh, how it works, so of course you got some kubectl, you have the Kubernetes cluster and you have IAM identity and access management. So kubectl makes some call. For example, I was checking the number of pods that are running there. So makes the call against the Kubernetes master. Kubernetes master can verify the identity that is provided by the kubectl against IAM, so it performs authentication. Uh, then it returns the callback on the Kubernetes and it can set up the authorization. So it can check after the IAM provides information. Yeah, this user exists. It has these credentials. Kubernetes cluster checks on the RBAC principle what kind of permission this user has. So can I provide the information about the, uh, the number of pods or the type of pods that are running on me? So based on that, the action is allowed or denied. It's, it's set up on the level of identity. So it might be user, it might be role as well, right? Yeah. So what version of Kubernetes does EKA support? Uh, you saw on the, on the console when I was running it that currently we support during the preview only the version 1.7. However, uh, if you work with Kubernetes, you know that the release cycle is pretty aggressive actually. They release new version each nine months. And each nine months, they stop to support or provide security updates for the old version. So whether you like it or not, you are pushed to upgrade or update to the latest version. Uh, process with the EKS is going to work uh, two ways. You may make your own decision whether you want us to do this upgrade automatically or you will do it manually. So usually what happens, you know, this, uh, there is a major version, like one, minor version eight, and the patch level, I don't know, two or three, whatever. So the, the patch level is usually just the security feature. So it doesn't break any kind of functionality or doesn't bring any kind of new functionality. So this will be done automatically for you. However, update the minor version might break your code that or any kind of pipelines that you set up for your Kubernetes cluster. So that's the reason you have the option to let us do it for you, or you can do it just you know with a click in at the time where it's comfortable for you, or when you are pushed by the uh, Kubernetes community that it's time to upgrade to the latest version. Yes. So the question is uh, whether this will be completely transparent to the user and not create any, any downtime. Yes, that's the intention. So that's the reason why we have three master nodes. So for you, this should not provide or introduce any kind of downtime. However, 
you might have situation that really your uh, code base is based on some old API that it's not supported in the new version, for example. So you have two options there. First of all, you might do any kind of blue-green deployment. So right, you create a new cluster because it's quite easy. You test all the functionality of your new code, put all the pods in there, let the pods on the old one drain up and uh, send the traffic with any kind of DNS solution that you are using to the new cluster. Or if you are feeling confident enough that you can do the in-place upgrade, that yeah, you can do it without any downtime. Just make sure the functionality works even after the upgrade. Good. Um, Autoscaling. Uh, can I use the auto scaling with Amazon EKS? Yeah, and we already mentioned it. So there might be three levels of auto scaling. So first level is at the master level, which we will do for you. Then uh, there is a level of the uh, EC2 instances that will start for you automatically based on the metrics that you define yourself. And then uh, on the pod level that is usually managed by the Kubernetes cluster. So you know, if you if you set up that you need four, five, six pods, it does that for you. So yes, private link. Private link is a solution that we introduced on last reInvent as well. And it allows you or appears as an ENI, Elastic Network Interface, in your own VPC, even if they reside in another VPC. So that helps you to basically have the traffic between two different VPCs without the need to, tra to tra let it travel through the internet. So kind of VPC peering similar functionality that you have. And here how it works with the, uh, with the EKS master. So as I mentioned, EKS masters are running in AWS control plane where you don't have the access. However, they expose the endpoint to this private link interface in your own VPC. So that's the reason that during the creation of the cluster, it needs to know which VPC it has to uh, connect to the worker nodes. Fargate, uh, this is something that's on the roadmap. It has been mentioned here. It's another step of uh, cloudification and micro whatever Asian uh, we got there because as you see, OK, we removed the burden, operational burden of the EKS masters, but you still have to deal with starting your own EC2 instances through the CloudFront template currently. Uh, but what if you don't want to deal even with that level of infrastructure? You don't want to deal with servers at all, right? Fargate is the solution. So Fargate is a new technology that runs containers without the need to manage underlying infrastructure. So what you basically define as of now, the current solution that works with the ECS, uh, Elastic uh, Container Service that we provide, is that you define the amount of resources that you want to be available for your containers or task that might contain what one to 10 different containers uh, at, the, at this task level. So if you want to use, I don't know, one CPU and two GB of RAM, you set it up and somewhere magic happens and we will give you available these resources. It's similar like when you run a Lambda code. When you run the Lambda code, you need to define how much uh, memory this Lambda code can leverage. Right? Fargate is the same. You don't care about the underlying infrastructure in that. So what that means for you is no infrastructure to manage at all. Uh, everything what you manage is at the container level, which is pretty cool. It's launched easily. You heard Yiji, he likes it a lot. He was testing it currently. It's available in the uh, US East in Northern Vir Virginia with the ECS solution. And it runs seamlessly. He told me before the meeting, like how much he loves this functionality, how he's eager to have this in uh, in Frankfurt region, because he can use it just immediately. And the pricing is based on the resources that are running. So let's assume you define this one CPU, uh, two GB of RAM. So it will be uh, multiplied by the number of seconds that your containers will run with that specification. As I mentioned, it works with the ECS, but it's on our roadmap to make sure that this functionality will be available for the EKS user. So you should be able to use it with Kubernetes. So what you will deal as a developers just with your containers. 
all underlying infrastructure should be some kind of you know removed away from you so you don't need to take care for that with kubernetes project we are pretty vocal about prioritizing uh, the open source community so we are trying to work them as hard as possible to make sure that as I mentioned all this functionality that will be part of the EKS out of the box will be available for any upstream open source Kubernetes cluster and we are currently working with uh, with guys from Pinterest we've works and Tigera uh, making sure that this functionality is built in is tested it's stable and so on so what we do, among the other things, like adding the new functionalities, uh, our guys that are part of the open source team do the code reviews as well, provide fixing bugs, and of course, implementing the new features. So, what's next for you? First, if you are interested and didn't do it yet, sign up for the preview, if you want to. Uh, service will be generally available this year. And there is a link, awsamazon.com slash eks slash preview, where you can sign up for the preview. However, until you will get access to the EKS, what you can do, you can try yourself Kubernetes on AWS workshop that is freely available on the GitHub, uh, where you have step-by-step -step process how to set up the Kubernetes cluster on AWS, and then you have two separate tracks. One is for system administrators, and one is for developers. So you can focus on your part of job with kind of guidance that is available there. Uh, as I said, on GitHub, it's free, of course, it's, it's open. However, you will incur some costs of the resources. Uh, there is a link on the, on the calculator, the simple monthly calculator, uh, which shows that if you run it just for one day, full day, 24 hours, it will cost approximately $20. So if you run it for the half day, it will cost you $10. Keep that in mind. So after you finish your workshop, don't forget to clean up the resources so you will not incur further costs. But it might be a great way to play with the Kubernetes on AWS. Uh, on AWS platform. Do we have any more questions? Oh yeah, so first was Peter. So the question was about the pricing of the EKS. I have absolutely no idea. The thing is, even uh, I suppose our service team currently has no clear idea how much the service will cost. So at the GA, of course, we will advertise the cost because all the pricing is public for us. But at the current stage, sorry, don't know. There was another question it's from you. A oh, gentleman over there. Uh, the question was whether Fargate will support the GPU. I don't know at the current stage because it's pretty new solution. As far as I know, currently you cannot just choose the GPU-based instances uh, or GPU-based functionality on Fargate. However, I already heard this feedback from few of the customers, so I will send it back to the service team that they should uh, probably build this functionality. On the other side, if you want this control of what kind of instance, whether it has GPU, it doesn't have how much RAM, you can s achieve it now with the EC2 instances. So probably the whole idea not to take care of the underlying infrastructure, if you build this functionality into the Fargate, it would just go away. So if it will be available, I cannot say because I don't know. There was a question here. Yes. So, uh, so you, you use your AWS identity, it's fine. Um, but I know with, with Box, for example, you can set up the batch and how to actually uh, need to log into the batch and uh, So this is something which is, uh, I guess, compliant. The, the masters are available from the outside internet. There's no way to uh, restrict the network from there. So, so the question is whether we plan to put any kind of bastion host in front of the EKS master nodes. Uh, let's, let's take a look from this point of view. If you are connecting to AWS platform directly from the command line, AWS CLI, are you using any kind of bastion host? Probably not, right? You have your access key and the secret key. 
And it's the same principle for Kubernetes cluster. So if you don't have these credentials that you will check at the time you will do the kubectl call against the cluster, you will be not allowed to do anything, right? So currently there is no restriction on that level of ports or, uh, or let's say rather IP addresses, not just the ports. Uh, so if but if there is such kind of requirement from uh, a compliance perspective, we should definitely take a look at that. Another question? Uh, so the IP addresses uh, of the uh, masters, if they are advertised through the direct connect. Yeah, but uh, for the masters, you will not see the IP addresses in general, right? For masters, the only thing you see is this URL for you. So you don't see what IP address ranges those uh, instances behind the load balancer are actually having, and you don't need to know. Or you do? Okay, let, let's speak about the, the presentation, the concrete use case. I'm, I'm really interested in that. Another one. So, if we don't have any more, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and great questions. I really like them a lot. I will be still here available for a few more minutes, so if you have anything specific that you want to discuss, um, feel free to reach out to me. Other than that, thank you very much and have a nice evening. <laughs>